Holy shit, lads, the trailer for the fifth season of My Hero Academia just dropped, and man, does it look sick! And, as someone who has read the entirety of the manga, I can confirm that the next season is gonna be cool. The trailer showed some stuff from the joint training arc, which is cool and all, but you know what's even cooler? The League of Villains arc, which is set to be adapted this spring. God, the League of Villains arc is awesome because it finally digs into the backstories of the comic's villains and really makes them more sympathetic, well-rounded characters. Take Twice, for example. Great character. In this arc, we learn his backstory. That backstory being, he was in a motorcycle accident when he was a teenager that wasn't his fault. He got fired. He was unable to get another job. He became homeless. He fell into depression and resorted to crime to support himself, then had a massive mental breakdown. And then he became a bad guy for the good guys to beat up. So that's, yeah, that's uh, an uncomfortably realistic backstory. I mean, the army of clones trying to murder you part doesn't usually happen in real life, but a sudden firing making you homeless, being forced to crime to support yourself, homeless people having mental health issues that go untreated, those are some massive societal problems that don't just exist in the cool superhero show. And, uh, I think that maybe it would be good to take a minute and talk about the kind of problematic relationship superhero fiction has with structural issues. I like superheroes. I have always loved superheroes. Shit, I like superheroes so much that I host a podcast where I review superhero movies. I love Silver Age Camp. I love creative superpowers. I love big, unique fights. I love characters who have the ability to do anything and use that power to help others. I think that's a really powerful theme, and superhero fiction does it better than any other. And you know what? There are some damn good writers in superhero fiction. Some of the stories that have impacted me the most have been stories about men in tights flying around, wham bam pow in crime. I'm also a fan of shonen anime for a lot of the same reasons. And, as you would expect, I'm a big fan of My Hero Academia. My Hero Academia, or Boku no Hero Academia, or BNHA, or Macademia, or Green Naruto, or whatever you want to call it, is a shonen manga written by Kohai Horikoshi. It takes place in a world where nearly all of humanity possesses superpowers and focuses on a group of teenagers training to become professional superheroes. Basically, Harry Potter but with superheroes. And it's a great series. It has strong characters, high stakes, creative fights, all the things that make superhero fiction work. Moreover, it's a series that is, at its core, about how heroes inspire people, which I just adore as a theme. And the ongoing anime by Studio Bones is even better, adding in stellar animation and great music. I mean, sure, it occasionally falls into the problems common in the modern anime industry, but overall, it is a great show. I like My Hero Academia. I really do. Before I get too far into this video, I want to make it clear that this video is not made to say that My Hero Academia is bad, or that Kohei Horikoshi is a bad person, or that any of the works or creators that I discuss in this video are bad, or that any of you are bad for enjoying them. I'm focusing on My Hero Academia specifically because it was the work that helped me hone in on some less than stellar trends in superhero fiction. So, what is this video about? Well, put simply, My Hero Academia has a villain problem. Part 1. Falling Through the Cracks Let's jump back a few decades. In the Silver Age of comic books, villains tended to be a bit one-dimensional. There are a lot of Silver Age villains who have the motives of, Hrrrrng, I'm evil, I want to steal some shit, ha 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 And although I do sometimes enjoy the comically over-the-top bad guys of the 50s and 60s, it's probably for the best that villains gained depth as years went on. In modern superhero fiction, most villains aren't one-dimensional. They're motivated by character faults, or have goals beyond being evil for evil's sake. Some of the most acclaimed supervillains are the ones who are sympathetic to the point where the audience questions whether or not it is really right for the heroes to stop them. And the over-the-top, cartoonishly evil villains of the Silver Age still have a place in superhero fiction, either as deconstructions of classic villain tropes, or as terrifying monsters who revel in their own sadism. 
Supervillains becoming better written over time is a good thing, not just because it makes for better stories, but because it is more realistic. In real life, most people who commit crimes aren't irredeemable monsters who are evil for the sake of being evil. But, for better or for worse, the most common way to give a villain depth is to give them a sympathetic backstory. This isn't just a comic book thing, mind you, but it is very common in comic books. An easy way to keep a villain from being one-dimensional is to show the bad things that happened in their past, and that's why they're evil. Take the Riddler, for example. In the Silver Age, he was just some dude who was really into puzzles. But in modern comics, he's evil because his abusive father beat him as a child for being smart, which is deeper writing, I guess. Let's jump back to My Hero Academia for a minute. The overall main antagonist faction in My Hero Academia is a group called the League of Villains. They're a loose organization of supervillains dedicated to a singular goal, overthrowing a society that idolizes superheroes. All of the core members of the League have sympathetic backstories. I've already mentioned Twice, who was forced into villainry after being ostracized by society and became fiercely loyal to the League because they were the only people who would accept him for who he was. Also in the League are Shigaraki, who became a villain after accidentally murdering his family and being groomed by another supervillain to be evil. There's Dobby, who hates superheroes because his abusive father is one of the world's most successful superheroes. Toga is evil because of mental illness, possibly caused by an abusive childhood. Possibly caused by her powers, possibly caused by both. Mr. Compress is motivated by a desire to fight the corruption that plagues superheroes. Spinner is evil because he was a victim of fantasy racism and latched on to the first organization he thought would change the world. And Magne is a trans woman who was implied to have been pushed to crime because of how she was treated for being trans. Also, she's brutally murdered with little fanfare to establish how dangerous a new villain is, which was the first time the series actually killed a character off, which is something I have thoughts about. The members of the League all have sympathetic backstories, which is good. Some of my favorite moments in My Hero Academia come from the friendships of the show's villains. Toga helping twice through his breakdown in the overhaul arc? Fantastic scene. And really, even though they're bad guys, it's hard not to root for them. After twice is murdered by the superhero Hawks for being too powerful, Spinner refers to the team as a gang of strays who happen to find each other, and Toga, in a poignant line, reflects on Twice's death by asking, Will they kill me as well? If Hero's duty is to save people, was Twice not a person in their eyes? And as he's dying, Twice sounds like a hero. These are sympathetic, interesting characters. So, what's the problem? Why is it bad that the villains are complex characters? What's the problem with the bad guys being a bunch of people broken down by societal oppression trying to overthrow the system? Oh, right. That's the problem, isn't it? Although superhero fiction has grown to acknowledge that people who commit crimes are, you know, people with actual motives beyond being evil, the genre hasn't really changed much beyond that. Even though villains these days have these really sad backstories now, the overall plot structure is still bad guy tries to commit crime, good guy punches him. And that's kind of weird, right? Like, why is it that in superhero fiction, all that heroes do to fight crime is beat up bad guys? Like, if Twice is a bad guy because he was homeless, and Toga is a bad guy because she's mentally ill, wouldn't ending homelessness and improving mental health services accomplish the same thing as beating them up? Hell, it would probably do more good. Because not only would ending homelessness stop homeless people from becoming supervillains, it would also, you know... And homelessness. And don't say that ending homelessness isn't something that the heroes in My Hero Academia couldn't at least help with. They have like 50 stadiums for training the students, and one of the teachers literally has the power to create buildings. They could at the very least do something. And it's not just the League. Gentle is a villain, in a large part, because his life was ruined by laws that prevent people from using their superpowers in public without a license. And after hearing his backstory, the main characters don't go, Hey, 
Maybe we shouldn't punish people for trying to use their powers to help others. Even though a few arcs back, Midoriya and Todoroki were almost arrested under the same bullshit laws for using their powers to save Vita's life, they still don't make any effort to change the law. They don't even say, this law is bad. They just go along with the punishment without any question. And this isn't just a problem in My Hero Academia, mind you. Half of Batman's enemies are mentally ill, and there is a lot we can discuss about the demonization of the mentally ill in pop culture. But, setting that aside for a second, let's look at this from an in-universe perspective. Scarecrow, the Joker, Two-Face, etc. are evil because they are mentally ill. Arkham Asylum does not give adequate treatment to help them, so innocent people are put in danger. So, if you were billionaire Bruce Wayne, what would you do to fix the problem with mentally ill supervillains killing people? Do you A. Buy the place and fix it, or B. Buy a military jet so you can more easily beat up crazy people, even though that does nothing to fix the overall problem? And yes, they do occasionally say that Batman does philanthropic work, but considering the fact that it never has any effect on either Gotham or Batman's bank account, he probably isn't given much. And don't bring up the game Arkham Asylum. Yes, Batman funds security measures to prevent constant breakouts, which is nice, but it isn't the core issue. Why is a terrible, archaic asylum that arguably makes its patients worse the only mental health facility in Gotham? Why doesn't Batman use his money to open a better mental health facility instead of just throwing his enemies through the revolving door that is Arkham? It creates a logical inconsistency with Batman as a character. Either he doesn't actually care about Gotham, or he thinks the mentally ill are broken people who exist to commit crimes. And I mean... That second one is true about Frank Miller's Batman, but better writers show Batman wanting the people in Arkham to get better. But if he wants them to get better, why doesn't he do anything to fix Gotham's mental health services? And shit, there are bigger problems superheroes could fix than causes for crime. Where's the issue of Spider-Man where he goes after a pharma CEO for inflating the price of insulin? Batman likes saving children? Where's the movie where Batman takes on ice? Superman fights for justice? Even a cursory glance at the US legal system reveals some pretty big injustices for him to destroy. The point is, if you make a villain sympathetic by making their actions a result of problems in society, but don't have the hero take any action to fix society, you aren't making a sympathetic villain. You're making an unsympathetic hero. Although, to be fair, there is a character in My Hero Academia who tries to fix society. His name is Stain. Part 2. Challenging the Status Quo The world of My Hero Academia is built around superheroes. Superheroes aren't just heroes, they're celebrities. The public idolizes them. And, much like how superhero media can be inspiring in real life, the series shows that its setting's most popular heroes are an inspiration to the main characters. The main character's mentor, All Might, stands out for not only being a powerful hero, but also for being such a kind, determined, selfless man that his very existence pushes others to be better people. And this idea, that superheroes can be icons for hope, is part of why I love superhero fiction and one of the reasons why My Hero Academia is such a good series. But at the same time, having a society that worships superheroes comes with its downside, because superheroes are human, and a lot of humans are, well, giant assholes. A lot of the professional superheroes shown in My Hero Academia are selfish dicks motivated more by a lust for money and fame than any sincere desire to help people. This is most notably shown by the superhero Endeavor. Remember how I mentioned earlier that one of the main bad guys hates superheroes because his dad was abusive? Yeah, Endeavor's that guy's father! Ugh. At the start of the show, Endeavor is the second most successful superhero in Japan, beaten out only by All Might. His main motivation is to beat All Might, or failing that, have one of his sons beat him. To beat All Might, Endeavor did some eugenics, made a super baby, isolated him from his family, put him through horrifically intense training, and after his bad parenting seemingly killed his eldest son, he did it again with his youngest. 
Endeavor being an asshole isn't just bad because it affected his kids though. Like I said, My Hero Academia makes it clear that superheroes, at least within the context of the story, inspire people to do good. All Might is shown to be such a good hero that his very existence causes crime rates to plummet. And that's cool and all, but it's also insanely fragile. After All Might is forced into retirement due to injuries inflicted by the supervillain All for One in the middle of Season 3, society almost crumbles. Crime shoots through the roof and, perhaps more importantly, society's faith in heroes crumbles. Perhaps I was too hard on the main characters when I said that the heroes of My Hero Academia don't take any action to fix society beyond beating up bad guys. Midoriya and co. are aware that heroes inspire people and strive to be better heroes, but that doesn't really fix the problem with the fact that the only thing keeping crime rates down is one old man a few years away from retirement, nor does it fix the issue with heroes being corrupt or any of the other systemic issues that cause crime that I mentioned earlier. I mean, the school gives some media training in one chapter, but that was more focused on being cool than being moral. Also, it's shown that female superheroes are pressured to be sexy and wear skimpy clothing, which is kind of messed up, and the school staff seems to be okay with the same pressure being forced onto their 15-year-old students. When All Might finally retires, the heroes are left dangling. They don't really have any proactive ideas about stopping crime other than, well, replace All Might which they try to accomplish by either A, waiting for Midoriya to grow up and take over for him, or B, hoping that Endeavor stops being an asshole. During the second season of My Hero Academia, we are introduced to a character who wants to make heroes better. Jizome Akaguro, aka Stain, is a vigilante inspired by All Might. He wants the world to be filled with kind, charismatic heroes who the public can admire like All Might. And seeing the sea of money-driven, uninspiring heroes before him, he dedicates himself to making heroes better people. By murdering a bunch of random superheroes, then trying to murder three children, then getting his ass kicked by said children. Yeah, Stain is not a good person. Honestly, his motives are kinda dumb. But there is something about Stain that we should make a note of. He is aware of the problems in the hyper-capitalist, greed-driven system that superheroes work under and take steps to change it. And the heroes don't. They treat the system as a part of life, even though it creates men like Endeavor. As far as the main characters are concerned, bad superheroes are bad because of their choices, not because the system that pays based on popularity influences their choices in any way. Stain is not the only villain in My Hero Academia who tries to change society. Overhaul is a Yakuza member dissatisfied with the fact that supervillains have basically replaced the Mafia. His evil plan? Getting rid of superpowers and returning society to a world resembling ours. And I don't know if that's really that bad of a goal. Deku's backstory of being treated as inferior for not having superpowers wouldn't have happened if Overhaul succeeded. The Todoroki brothers wouldn't have been abused to make them into superheroes if superpowers didn't exist. Eri and Shigaraki's backstories of accidentally murdering their families when they lost control of their powers sure as hell wouldn't happen in a world without superpowers. And I mean, Overhaul is definitely evil. His plan involves torturing a child to create magic bullets. It's good that Deku demolishes him, but he isn't evil because his goals are evil. Or at the very least, the series never does anything to show that his goal of eradicating superpowers would be a bad thing. The League of Villains, as previously mentioned, are a group of misfits failed by society for various reasons. The League doesn't really have much of an end goal, really, other than wanting to overthrow a society that glorifies superheroes. But they still deserve mention because, again, the theme of villains wanting to change the status quo keeps appearing in My Hero Academia. And nowhere is this more apparent than in the League of Villains arc. The League of Villains arc or the Metahuman Liberation Army arc if you want to use its official name, pits Shigaraki and the League against a group of revolutions called, well, 
the MetaHuman Liberation Army. Right off the bat, the MLA is completely different from any other villain group in My Hero Academia thus far. While the League is a loose group of losers and the Shie Hasaikai are a mob organization, the MLA is an army, more than 100,000 members strong, with relatively realistic goals. The MLA and their leader Redestro do not like government regulations on superpowers. They believe that instead of only state-sponsored law enforcement being allowed to use their abilities, every human has the intrinsic right to use their own bodies as they see fit. And that's... not really an evil goal. I first read this arc back in June. I read all of it in a single sitting, and when I finished it, I was left feeling... unsatisfied. This arc is the one that really made me hone in on My Hero Academia's contradictory themes about oppression and the status quo. It's a story about a bunch of people who want to change society because it failed them, going up against a revolutionary group trying to change society for the better. It's portrayed as being a battle of evil against evil. And at the end, the two groups join forces to fight the comic's good guys. And I was left asking, why? Why is the MetaHuman Liberation Army portrayed as evil? Why is the League? Why is Stain? Why is Overhaul? And the answer isn't because they do evil things, because that isn't what I'm asking. Why is it that in My Hero Academia, the protagonists are dedicated to upholding the status quo, and the only people who question the status quo are portrayed as evil? Why is it that the series simultaneously shows villains as being evil because of structural issues, but at the same time demonizes characters who want to fix those issues? And these villains are never portrayed as being evil because of a flaw in their ideals. Overhaul isn't a bad guy because getting rid of superpowers is an evil plan. He's a bad guy because he tortures Aerie. The MLA isn't bad because they want people to be able to use their powers. They're bad because they're a cult. Dobby isn't bad because he hates his abusive father. He's bad because he kills people and ruins his dad's reputation by bringing up the whole child abuse thing. Their ideals aren't countered or even discussed. The heroes don't defeat them because their ideas are bad, but because they themselves are bad people. And that's kind of shitty. Looking over the series as a whole, My Hero Academia seems to have a pretty strong central theme that questioning the status quo is something that only bad people do. Which isn't a good message. And I wish this was just a problem with My Hero Academia but it is far from the only piece of superhero media with this theme. Killmonger, the main antagonist of Black Panther, wants to end white supremacy and reverse the effects of the colonial conquest of Africa. He's a really sympathetic character, but the film also portrays him as being a genocidal tyrant who Black Panther has to stop. At the end of the film, T'Challa says that Killmonger wasn't wrong and vows to use Wakanda's wealth to help the people of the world, by sharing some technology and fighting aliens, instead of, you know, radically reshaping the world to end systemic oppression like Killmonger wanted. Also, the film is really pro-monarchy, which is bad. Poison Ivy from Batman's rogues gallery is motivated by a desire to protect the environment. Sometimes. Most of the time, she's portrayed as being a delusional psychopath, a sexy fan service femme fatale, a straw feminist, or some combination of all three. Magneto is... <sighs> Magneto is a Holocaust survivor fighting to protect a persecuted minority. And he's portrayed as being the bad guy because his methods are too harsh. Oh, and also they do that really shitty thing where they say, Actually, he isn't fighting for equality, and he's the real racist, which is totally not reminiscent of what real people say about civil rights activists. <laughs> God, in a comic where the U.S. government has attempted genocide multiple times, the main bad guy is the Holocaust survivor fighting to protect his people? Wh what? To be fair, X-Men does feature the titular team who want mutant persecution to end, and they fight for this goal by, uh, being nice and asking the U.S. government to stop trying to eradicate them? By fighting Magneto? By having really complex soap opera storylines? Well, whatever they're doing, it isn't working. 
At the end of the day, Magneto fought for mutant rights by overthrowing an apartheid state and creating a safe haven for mutants. Professor X opened a school. Also, a lot of people have described Magneto as being a Malcolm X allegory, which is fucking bullshit, because Malcolm X never attempted to eradicate white people. Say what you will about the man, he never attempted to murder a teenager to power a death ray mounted on top of the Statue of Liberty. Also, also, talking about superheroes not really fighting systemic problems, the US government has attempted genocide multiple times, and maybe that's something the rest of the Marvel heroes could do something about, instead of just leaving the X-Men to deal with it. Also cubed, the Silver Age of comic books happened during the Civil Rights Movement. I feel like there were some more important evils going on at the time for the heroes to deal with than Egghead. I mean, there is that issue from 1970 where an old black man points this out to Green Lantern, but it's not like Green Lantern became fiercely dedicated to civil rights after that, and it doesn't erase the fact that in-universe, the civil rights movement happened and the Justice League just kind of ignored it. Even worse is when superhero media introduces villains who want to change society and then reveals that no, they don't, it was a lie, we had our villain act like real-life revolutionaries to give the story a sense of realism, but had their motives be fake so we didn't have to explore the morally gray things that they bring up. For example, the third Iron Man film introduces the Mandarin, a terrorist leader attempting to overthrow the US government. His motives aren't super clear, but he brings up violence committed by the US government, widespread political corruption, and subservience to massive corporations as reasons for hating the United States and its president. And to be honest, those are real critiques, and his plan to murder the president for protecting executives responsible for a massive oil spill, while perhaps a bit violent, is at least interesting and a complex motive. But halfway through the film, it's revealed that the Mandarin is actually an actor working for Ultra Killian, a scientist who has a rivalry with Tony Stark. And although I do find it interesting that the film adapted a racist, fear-mongering, yellow peril fictional supervillain as a racist, fear-mongering fake persona created by the film's true antagonist, it is disappointing that the film throws away any chance of making its villain morally gray, especially considering the fact that the first Iron Man movie totally used that evil scary Muslim who is evil because they're evil trope. Also, you know, whitewashing. Bane in The Dark Knight Rises is, when you get down to it, a communist revolutionary. Or, at the very least, he talks like one. He gives these grand speeches about giving Gotham back to the people and overthrowing the corrupt. Bane wants to overthrow law and order because it keeps poor people poor and powerless. He's a perfect foil to Batman, a billionaire who fights to uphold the law. And also, everything he says is meaningless. He wants to nuke Gotham to get revenge on Batman. Nothing he says has any bearing on his actual actions throughout the film. And The Dark Knight Rises is a worse movie because of it. In a Rolling Stone interview with Dark Knight Rises director Christopher Nolan, Nolan addressed accusations that the film was a critique of the Occupy Wall Street movement, stating, We put a lot of interesting questions in the air, but that's simply a backdrop for the story. What we're really trying to do is show the cracks of society, show the conflicts that somebody would try to wedge open. We're going to get wildly different interpretations of what the film is supporting and not supporting, but it's not trying to do any of those things. It's just telling a story. What's the worst thing our villain Bane can do? What are we most afraid of? He's going to come in and turn our world upside down. That has happened to other societies throughout history many times, so why not here? Why not Gotham? We want something that moves people and gets under the skin. The films aren't intended to be political. You don't want to alienate people, you want to create a universal story. And I think that's really telling. It gives us an insight into how works like this, which feature people trying to fix society portrayed as villains, are written. If no one is to be believed, the reason so many superior stories feature villains trying to fight systemic evil is because doing so means changing society, which means destroying the world we know, which for a lot of people, especially those not being negatively affected by our society, is terrifying. They start with the idea of a villain overthrowing society, then they come up with the reasons after the fact. Side note, 
In that same interview, Nolan says that the Dark Knight trilogy is non-political and that all the political stuff is just window dressing. And that's kind of bullshit. You don't get to make a film whose hero tortures terrorists for information and spies on innocent people to catch bad guys and say, This is not political. You especially can't do it in 2000 goddamn 8. This villain problem is not just present in superhero media. Die Hard did the whole fake terrorist thing years before Iron Man 3. The main villain during the first season of The Legend of Korra is Amon, the leader of a revolutionary group called the Equalists, who seek to strip away the world's bending abilities. The Equalists are motivated both by violence committed by bender triads, and by the fact that Republic City is controlled by an unelected council containing no benders. The Equalists are eventually defeated when it is revealed that Damon was lying about his backstory. Gasp. That sure does invalidate his points. Although the Equalists are defeated, their actions directly lead to Republic City becoming a representative democracy and the election of a non-bender president. The White Fang from Ruby is a civil rights movement turned terrorist group fighting for the rights of the Faunus, who are animal people that are segregated or even enslaved by normal humans. Nothing about the White Fang is different from other groups in this essay, but they deserve special mention for never doing anything to advance their goals other than random acts of destruction. Let's take a closer look at this trope. Dig into its implications. If every person who tries to change society in superior fiction and related genres is evil, that kind of implies that wanting to change society is evil. It implies that wanting to fix systemic oppression is wrong. That the only people who would try to do so are lying about their motives. That all you can do is suck it up, accept that the world is broken, and never question anything. And that is a really, really bad message. Part 3. Exceptions that prove the rule. Now, of course, there are exceptions. This essay is discussing a bad trend in superhero fiction. Not saying that this trope is inherent in superhero fiction, or that there aren't writers who have bucked this trend. But, to be honest, I can really only think of, like, three good exceptions. I mean, obviously, I don't know every single superhero story ever written off the top of my head. But it is kind of distressing that after years of consuming hours upon hours of superhero media, I can only think of three superhero stories where A, the protagonist attempts to bring about social change, and B, the protagonist is not portrayed as villainous for doing so. Grant Morrison's Animal Man Run is one of the best superhero stories ever written. It's a deconstruction of superhero comics with one of the most complex protagonists I've ever seen in superhero media. Usually, when people talk about Animal Man, they discuss the later issues, which delve into what the concepts of free will and changing continuity mean to a comic character, culminating with Buddy learning that he's a fictional character and meeting with writer Grant Morrison. And those issues are phenomenal, but they aren't what I want to talk about today. Another aspect of Animal Man that really interested me that people don't talk about as much is its analysis of superheroes and their role in society. Buddy Baker, despite being a superhero and member of the Justice League, is constantly plagued by insecurity, both over being a C-list hero and over his inability to do anything substantial to stop the evils of the world. Over the course of the series, Buddy becomes an animal rights activist. Morrison's run features issues where Animal Man fights poaching and frees lab animals. It also features an issue where Animal Man teams up with Buana Beast to fight the South African apartheid. Morrison's allowance of his hero to fight issues that normal superheroes avoid helps his Animal Man run be one of the best superhero comics ever written. But then again, Animal Man is a deconstruction of superheroes. Buddy does things other than beat up criminals because normal superheroes generally don't. Deconstructionist superhero stories are where you get most stories about superheroes doing more than fighting crime. Stories like Superman Red Sun, Miracle Man, Watchmen, and The Boys, to name a few, all feature superheroes bringing serious political change to the world. But what sets Animal Man apart is the fact that Buddy Baker is never portrayed as anything but heroic. Even when he messes up and questions his actions, it's because he's a kind, caring man who wants to make the world a better place. 
Usually, when superhero deconstructions have the protagonist change the world, it's treated as them taking a step towards the dark side. For example, Miracle Man ends with the titular character taking over the world and transforming it into an Ancom utopia. But the series also treats Miracle Man's utopia creation as a sign that he's lost his touch with humanity. And Moore's run ends on a melancholy note, with a lonely Miracle Man staring out over his dominion and questioning if he's done the right thing. The second of my three exceptions comes from another fantastic superhero deconstruction work. The New Frontier by Darwin Cook. The New Frontier takes DC comics from the 50s and actually sets them in the 50s. For example, in real life, most superhero comics from the 40s were cancelled in the early 50s. This is usually blamed on Frederick Wortham's seduction of the innocent and the government regulations it brought. And to be fair, Wortham's brilliant use of scientific methods certainly played a part. But the decline had begun years earlier and was more a result of readers growing bored with the comics of the era. Anyway, the superheroes of the 1940s disappearing also happens in The New Frontier. But in-universe, it's caused by the U.S. government arresting them during the Red Scare. The New Frontier is a really interesting book that touches on the Korean War, the space race, and McCarthyism, while still managing to be a stellar superhero tale. One subplot in The New Frontier focuses on a new superhero named John Henry, an African-American superhero who goes to war with the Ku Klux Klan after the murder of his wife and daughter. Ultimately, John is killed in a truly heartbreaking scene. The John Henry storyline is only a minor part of the miniseries. Its only real connection to the main storyline is to make Martian Manhunter lose his faith in humanity. But it is nice to read a story about a superhero wholly dedicated to fighting a group of white supremacists that the government all but refuses to stop. Also, they pretty much removed him from the movie version, which is just great. Right now, I'd like to take a moment to talk about some edge cases, some failed attempts to tie superheroes into social movements, and after that, I'll take a step back and try to get into why these tropes are so common in superhero fiction. First off, yes, superheroes fought in World War II. If you want to count that as an example of superheroes using their power to change society for the better, I suppose that counts. I don't really count it because it's less a character deciding to fight for progress and more an example of a character doing what the government tells them. The exception, of course, being Captain America, who fought Nazis months before the U.S. entered the war. Also, the superheroes who fought in World War II did a really shitty job, judging by the fact that they had zero impact on the outcome of the war. Going a bit more recent, the Netflix show Luke Cage was heavily influenced by the Black Lives Matter protests that began in 2013. Its protagonist is, put bluntly, a bulletproof black man wearing a hoodie, and it is not my place to speak about the impact this show had on the black community. For what it's worth, I think it's a fantastic show, but I don't really think it works as a show about the BLM movement. The show is about, to borrow a term racist use when you bring up the fact that American cops are the most violent police in the world, black-on-black crime. All the show's major villains are black criminals, with the sole exception being Shades Alvarez, a Hispanic criminal. The show's deuterologist is a police detective. The show does feature bad police officers, yes, but they aren't bad because they're violent or racist. They're bad because they take bribes from mobsters and let suspects talk to their lawyers, which is bad, apparently. Having the bad cops be bad because of individual acts of corruption misses the whole point of a social movement born from institutional problems. People aren't marching because they hate it when cops take bribes from supervillains named after snakes. They're marching because, across the nation, police face no consequences for violence against innocent people, a majority of them black. Even later in the series, when the police start hunting Luke, it isn't because he's black or because he wears a hoodie. It's because he's framed for murdering a police officer. Luke Cage's much worse sister show, Iron Fist, also tries and fails to tackle contemporary social issues. The show's protagonist, who inherits billions of dollars in controlling shares of a large pharmaceutical company after being lost in the mountains for years, ends up learning that his new drug company is kinda... evil. Danny attempts to fix this, shutting down a plant that gives people cancer and forcing the company to sell a new drug at cost, which is good. Danny's a nice dude, but it doesn't fix the problem of whether or not people get medicine being dependent on whether or not Danny is feeling charitable at the moment. And 
having to rely on pharmaceutical executives choosing people over profit isn't a good solution to real problems. We can't wait for the long-lost heir to Eli Lilly to return from the mountains and make insulin affordable. That isn't going to happen. Also, Danny has given billions of dollars and immense power over other people's lives for just existing, which is maybe not the best thing for society, just saying. Part of the reason superheroes rarely fight for social causes is the comic industry's dedication to the status quo. The worlds of DC or Marvel are supposed to be identical to our own, save for the existence of superheroes. This does strain credibility a bit, considering the fact that things like alien invasions, objective proof of deities, and revolutionary advances in science not only existing, but having been part of the world for decades should make superhero worlds completely unrecognizable. Mr. Fantastic could probably cure cancer, but he won't because Marvel Comics needs to take place in the real world. I get why they do it. You need stories to be relatable to readers. But at the same time, it also makes superhero stories come off as ridiculously unrealistic. For example, during the fourth season of the show Arrow, a supervillain nukes a small city, killing 10,000 people, which should have probably had an effect on the world similar to 9-11. And it doesn't. It's barely mentioned after it happens, save a few episodes dealing with Felicity's guilt over her role in the disaster and it being the impetus for Ragman's introduction. More insidiously, the adherence to keeping superhero worlds like our own leaves everything feeling kind of pointless. I know I'm going to piss some people off by saying this, but superhero comics don't have great stakes a lot of the time. Like, oh shit, the Nazis took over the US government, this is bad, except no, not really. It'll be fixed in a month, anyone who dies will be back in two years, and future comics will pretend it never happened. It's frustrating how pointless main universe superhero comics feel sometimes. Even if I got my wish, and we got more superhero stories where the protagonists fought for social change, it probably wouldn't matter. Because nothing does. Anything they fought for would be back to normal as soon as a new writer took over. So, what are we left with? Superior stories acknowledge that the world is complicated and villains are often created by their circumstances, but at the same time, superheroes refuse to fight evil through any method other than beating up villains after they commit a crime. Anyone who tries to change society is treated like a villain and killed or imprisoned. The only exceptions are deconstructionist stories, and nothing matters because superior stories are afraid to have anything their characters do impact the world in any way. Hurrah. Before I go any further, I'd like to note that this is not a call-out post. I am not making this video to attack superhero writers. I'm not saying that Chris Nolan or Hori Koshi or Ryan Coogler or any of the other creators mentioned in this essay are bad people or bad writers. I mean, Frank Miller is, but you get my point. I don't think comic writers are evil because they don't write stories about superheroes fighting for social change. I can't think they're evil because... If they're evil, that means I'm evil. Part 4. The Tomato in the Mirror <sighs> So, backstory for this video. When I was 17, I wrote my first book. It was called Double Elimination, Soul Survivor. It was supposed to be the first in a sci-fi fantasy series about a fighting tournament for people with superpowers. It had some good ideas, but shoddy execution. Trust me, this is not an advertisement. It's kind of a shitty book. I self-published it right before I graduated high school and have been writing a sequel to it on and off for like three years now. Let's put a pin in that for a second. Back in the spring, I read Miracle Man and Animal Man, which taught me that superhero stories could have their heroes fight things other than criminals and aliens. Then, in June, I read through the League of Villains arc in a single sitting, walked away feeling unsatisfied, and decided that maybe I should make this video. Emphasis on maybe, I only follow through with like 5% of the project ideas I come up with. Still, the idea was rattling around in the back of my brain for months. It was still on my mind in October, when I decided to do some more work on book two and reread book one to ensure I didn't mess up any continuity. And, partway through the book, I closed my laptop and sat there in horror for a few minutes. Because, oh my god, I'm doing the same exact shit to superhero writers. I created a story where the world is constantly portrayed as dystopian, but the people fighting to fix it are evil. I won't bore you with the exact details, I'll put a footnote in the description that properly explains it. The point is, 
I wrote a story that simultaneously featured a world that had massive structural flaws and a story that portrayed the people trying to fix those flaws as villains. And after I realized this, I was just left wondering, why? I didn't set out to make a story using these tropes. I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to make a story where the people trying to overthrow the fascist dictatorship are the real bad guys. But that's what I made. That's what my first instinct was after years of consuming media with the same tropes. Years of indoctrination from school and just American culture in general. Years of being taught through what I saw and read and watched. I was taught that fighting against injustice is wrong if you do anything more than a government-approved peaceful protest, and that leaked into my writings. If you were wondering why I've dedicated 10,000 words, and however long this is at this point, to ranting about superhero tropes, this is why. Art influences us. Writers don't fall into these traps because of some insidious plan to poison the minds of children. They fall into these traps because they're subconsciously replicating what they've seen in the past. And I'm not saying that there's some big government conspiracy to manipulate the arts and control people. That exists, but I'm not talking about it right now. I'm saying that these tropes propagate like a virus, spreading from person to person without anyone in the chain knowing what's happening. It is my firm belief that stories affect us. I wouldn't be a writer if I didn't believe that to be true. Sometimes the effects stories have on us can be good. They can teach us empathy and understanding. But at the same time, some stories can make us hateful. They can make us afraid. They can make us cruel. If the superhero media I've consumed has had such a profound effect on me that I've been subconsciously using its less than savory tropes, what else has superhero media done to me? How has it affected how I view real people? How has it affected my reaction to social movements? How much of my own mind is controlled by others? And at this point, I think I should pull away the curtain and be honest with you all. This video isn't really about superheroes. Part 5. To Protect and Serve the lynching of George Floyd, the senseless killing of Breonna Taylor, and dozens of other cases in recent years have forced conversations on police brutality into the limelight like never before. This is not to say that these are new problems. Still, various factors have forced people who have ignored these issues in the past, <coughs> middle class white people like myself, to pay attention for the first time in their lives. Last year was radicalizing for a lot of people. For me, it wasn't the murders that broke me, nor was it the refusal by the state to prosecute those involved. Both of those things were horrific, but they weren't what finally pushed me from hashtag not all cops to going full ACAB. No, the thing that broke me was seeing the police response to the protest. For a few weeks, I could not sleep. I'd lie awake in bed watching video after video of police beating innocent people. I watched an SUV drive through a crowd of people. I watched as reporters were arrested and blinded. I watched a man get dragged away by armed thugs for saying he didn't hate them. I watched as a militia member killed two men in cold blood, walked past the police without being arrested, and was praised by both the president and the nation's most famous journalist. And it was heartbreaking. Not just the violence, but knowing without a shadow of a doubt, that these men would never face any punishment, that they continue working, continue hurting innocent people, and no one would stop them. This video is not about me. My feelings of hopelessness are nothing next to the insurmountable evil that is centuries of institutional racism and state violence. And... Already, I know what people are going to comment on this video. I spent enough time in nerd spaces to know that they don't take kindly to people talking about social justice. And before you post your comment about riots or the numbers 13 and 50, I just want to say, don't, please, I don't have the energy to deal with your bullshit. At this point, nothing I can say will change your views on the police. Not because you're right, but because you've deliberately chosen to live in a fantasy world because it's easier than acknowledging the horrors of real life. If I were to try and change your mind, I'd probably point out the fact that more than 90% of protests were completely peaceful, that police are deliberately escalating things as an excuse to beat and arrest protesters, or the fact that even if there were the mass riots that fascist propaganda networks pretend exist, 
that really won't have any effect on whether or not American police are trained to kill innocent people. But I'm sure you have a witty reply that falls apart under scrutiny that you can respond to all those points with. So, please just close the video and walk away. Okay, now that the assholes are gone, let's talk about what this has to do with superheroes. As I've stated previously, media and society influence one another. It's a loop. The world influences media, which influences the people who consume it, who go on to shape the world. I could talk for hours about how cop shows have shaped the public perception of the police, but I don't really watch enough police shows to have it be a good video. A week ago, I saw a scene of Blue Bloods as I was flipping through channels where Tom Selleck's character, the fictional commissioner of the NYPD, brushes off concerns of police brutality by saying that he, a fictional character, always fires bad cops immediately. So, you know, there's some stuff out there that could be talked about. But I don't really feel like watching 221 episodes of a shitty police procedural for this video. No, what I do enjoy is superhero media. And I think that superhero media, much like police shows, can give us insight into people's views on the police. Because, at the end of the day, superheroes are cops. Now, when I say superheroes are cops, I'm not saying that cops are superheroes like that one awful comic that everyone makes edits of. What I'm saying is superheroes are built around the same core concept as police. Superheroes are a special group of people who we allow to use force to stop evil. If anything, superheroes aren't just a reflection of police, they're the ideal version of police. People with nearly unlimited power who follow a code and only use that power to hurt criminals. These flawed tropes in superhero fiction, the refusal to use power to fix societal issues, the demonization of people fighting for social change, they exist in real life. If you were to go through this video and replace every instance of Batman or Deku with the state, the point would still stand. Why does the US government spend more money on having police arrest people for being homeless than on actually fixing homelessness? Why does the government spend so much money on the police and military and so little on fighting poverty? People in power know that people are formed by their circumstances, so why don't those in power care about changing those circumstances for the better? And if the government is going to spend all this money on the police, then why aren't they fighting for us? Why is all of the money concentrated into the hands of a handful of monopolists while the rest of us are buried in debt? Why, when millions of people are thrown onto the streets because of a pandemic, are the people who are supposed to protect us helping with evictions? Why is it that they'll strangle a man to death for maybe using a forged $20 bill, but won't touch any of the men burning the planet to the ground? Why is it that all the police ever seem to do is hurt and imprison poor people? I've talked a lot in this video about how superheroes stop revolutionaries and others who want to change the world for the better. And from a cursory glance at American history, police and U.S. military have definitely done the same. In 1985, the Philadelphia police took out the African-American anarchist group MOVE by bombing an entire neighborhood and firing at the survivors as they fled from burning buildings. In addition to the deaths of six MOVE members, the police killed five children and burned down the homes of 65 families unrelated to the conflict. And keep in mind, this isn't just the police. The FBI, CIA, and military are more than happy to murder Americans to protect the status quo. In 1970, the National Guard gunned down a herd of college students for protesting the Vietnam War. In the 50s and 60s, the FBI's COINTELPRO worked to undermine the civil rights movement through surveillance, disinformation, and sending spies into civil rights groups to destroy them from within. The FBI may pretend to praise Martin Luther King Jr. today, but never forget that they attempted to blackmail him into committing suicide. Never forget that in 1964, they had agents infiltrate the Nation of Islam and advocate that Elijah Muhammad murder Malcolm X and, after they found out about the plan that ultimately claimed Malcolm X's life, sat back and watched it happen. Never forget that in 1969, the FBI used the Chicago PD to assassinate members of the Black Panthers, including leader Fred Hampton. 
1921, there were two different states sanctioned air raids on American soil. In Tulsa, the National Guard and police helped a violent white mob slaughter dozens of black civilians, culminating in fire bombs being dropped from private aircraft. Two months later, the U.S. Army dropped bombs on Blair Mountain to end a conflict between police and miners attempting to unionize. And shit, if we look all the way back, some of the oldest police forces in the nation were born from slave catchers. Looking at history, we see time and time again the militarized arms of the states using their power to crush anyone who threatens the status quo. It feels like the police don't exist to keep people safe or even to enforce the law. It feels like they exist to hurt people who threaten the status quo. A status quo that is often built on white supremacy and institutional poverty. And I can see the comments on this video pointing out that all these people murdered by the US government weren't angels, and that that means it's okay that they died. But even if they commit crimes, aren't their punishments a bit excessive? Shouldn't they have gotten trials instead of death sentences? Even if the members of MOVE have parole violations, isn't it wrong for the Philadelphia police to murder their children? Even if Malcolm X had questionable views on race in his youth, isn't it wrong for the FBI to sit back and watch as he was murdered? Even if some BLM protesters burned down a target, isn't it wrong for police to beat thousands of peaceful protesters in a different state? And you have to ask yourself, were these acts of state violence committed because these people were morally gray, or were they committed because they broke the status quo? The police normally don't blind journalists for reporting on an act of arson, unless the arson was related to activists fighting against police brutality. Really, the sheer amount of police violence we've seen over the past year doesn't seem to be a reaction to the riots. It's a reaction to people questioning the idea that the police are allowed to kill whoever they want for whatever reason and face no consequences. This argument that revolutionaries and activists deserve to die if they're anything less than saints, it kind of reminds me of how superhero media demonizes its villains. It doesn't matter if the things that Magneto or Killmonger or Overhaul are fighting for are good, they did bad things so they need to be stopped. The only difference is superhero media demonizes the revolutionaries the heroes fight by having them torture children, and in real life opponents of Black Lives Matter demonize them for vandalism. I'm not saying the police kill black people because they watch too many superhero movies. That's ridiculous. I mean, the fact that large portions of the police and military idolize the Punisher is fucking terrifying, but state violence against people who question the status quo has been around longer than superheroes. Shit, it's been around longer than the US. But I don't think it's absurd to say that the constant demonization of activists in popular media has played its part in making us so ready to demonize real-life revolutionaries. More than half of the country blamed the victims of the Kent State Massacre for their own deaths. 75% of Americans hated MLK when he was alive, and we all have that relative or friend from high school who despises the Black Lives Matter movement and anti-fascists. Media and society have a symbiotic relationship. I wonder, if the media we enjoy wasn't so dedicated to the idea that people fighting against systematic evil are the real villains, how would we react to real revolutionaries? What would the world be like if our superheroes fought against racism with something other than passive acceptance? What would the world be like if they fought evils other than crime? I love superheroes, but as time goes on, it's getting harder and harder to love them. I enjoyed The Dark Knight Rises when it came out, but... After everything we've been through this year, it's hard to watch a movie featuring a climax where an army of cops beat up an army of communists. Because I know, deep down, that scenes like that are affecting me, teaching me to accept police brutality as a necessity to defeat evil. And maybe I'm putting too much stock in the importance of superhero films. Maybe. But maybe not. Part 6. The Final Exception in the 1940s, the Ku Klux Klan was growing in both members and political power. Activist Stetson Kennedy infiltrated the organization and studied them, hoping to destroy them. He took his information to the police, who refused to do anything with it. So, Kennedy took his findings to a group of people even more powerful than the police. He took his findings to the writers of the widely popular Superman radio show, in the 16-part story titled, The Clan of the Fiery Cross, Superman fought against the KKK. 
This story robbed the clan of their mystique, exposing the ridiculousness of their traditions and the cruelty of their actions. But more than that, it made them the villain. It made them an opponent of Superman, the living embodiment of truth, justice, and the American way. The story made it impossible for anyone to take the clan seriously. Superman defeated the Ku Klux Klan, and not just in the radio show. After the story aired, recruitment numbers for the Klan fell and never recovered. A white supremacist organization powerful enough to control the police was killed by Superman. Because stories have power, they shape who we are and who we want to be. And superhero media has the power to be so much more than what it is right now. It's a shame that so much of superhero media is dedicated to stories about men in tights fighting criminals but not fighting crime, or stories of superheroes fighting to uphold an unjust status quo. And maybe, if the superhero genre is not going to grow up, maybe it's time for me to find a new favorite genre. I've got time to think about the beauty of a thousand variations Of the beating of a wing, of a hummingbird suspended in the aspect of the world Moving slower than molasses as I'm off to catch the girl Who's falling off the bridge and I'm there before she knows it I'll be gone before she sees me, got my hand around her waist I pull it back to safety By the time she knows what's happened There'll be someone else who needs me Cause time keeps dragging on And on